My name is Dr. Paul Jacob and I'm an adult reconstruction surgeon at Community Hospital North in Oklahoma City. Um, I, this video is to prepare you for your surgery and uh, answer hopefully most of your preoperative questions, uh, including what happens on the day of surgery. We welcome you to our hospital and we are very proud that you chose us to have your surgery and we will do the very best we can to get you a great outcome. Robotic surgery in particular, makoplasty, has really advanced the way that we do joint replacement. It's taken most of the guesswork out of surgery. Now, prior to surgery, I can position the components exactly where I want them. I know exactly what your post-operative x-rays are gonna look like. I can dial in things like the straightness of your leg, the length of your leg, the position of rotation of your leg, so that we can really provide for you truly patient-specific sizing and component positioning that's unmatched in any other type of surgical planning or device. Well, congratulations, and uh, we look forward to helping you through this entire process, both before and of course during, and in particular even after. We're always here to su provide support, and we look forward to getting you through this journey and getting you uh, to the point where you feel you have a successful outcome. Hello, welcome to Community Hospital's Total Joint Replacement class for pre-op patient education. Today we're gonna to talk about how to get ready for surgery, how to prepare your home for surgery, some of the information you're going to hear from the hospital. We're gonna talk about pain management. We're going to talk about equipment that you may need. We're going to also show you equipment that the hospital will give you. And then we're gonna talk about some discharge planning and the roles for your caregivers, your family, friends, providers. So if you're watching this video, you're about to have surgery. There's a couple of things that are really important for you to do to optimize your body to get it ready to have surgery and have the best outcome possible. First thing I wanna ask you about is how active are you? Okay, a lot of ortho patients say, I can't exercise because it hurts too much. You can exercise, you can sit where you are, you can lay in a bed and you can still exercise. You can tighten and relax muscles. You can do ankle lifts, you do leg pumps. In the back of your book, are exercises that you can do that your physical therapist is gonna teach you to do after surgery. Better to learn those now and have them familiar with you than to try to learn something new after you've had surgery. The other thing that's really important, and we try to optimize this before surgery, is nutrition. Nutrition for ortho patients is extremely important. That bony skeletal structure is made up of minerals, calcium, iron, magnesium. You need all of those to prepare the body. You need it to help build the bones and you need it to optimize muscle tone. So the best place to get that is in your diet. So think about how much milk do you drink a day? Most people don't like milk. Think about your vegetable intake, your protein intake. Most people don't get enough of any of it. A lot of us take supplements. So a week before surgery, they're gonna tell you to stop taking all of your vitamins, your fish oil, the things that you use for supplements for your diet. After surgery, you can have those back. Be very cautious and careful about when you take your vitamins and when you take your supplements. Caffeine and alcohol inhibit some of these vitamins and minerals that the bone specifically needs for bone health. So if you're taking your vitamins in the morning, make sure you're taking them at least two hours before or two hours after caffeine. Also remember minerals need carriers. Calcium needs vitamin D, we all know that. Iron needs vitamin C. So maybe take your vitamins with a glass of milk or a glass of orange juice. Hydration is also very important. Most of us are chronically dehydrated. We don't like to drink water, it doesn't taste good. Most of us like caffeine and alcohol. So those are natural diuretics that makes us further dehydrated. The night before surgery, you don't eat or drink anything. So by the time you get to the hospital, you're pretty dry. That gives you a couple of challenges. Number one, your muscles are already sore and stiff. 
because they're dehydrated. Number two, your IV is harder to start and sometimes they're uncomfortable. If your veins are a little flat like that, then the IV stick is a little harder to do and that IV catheter bounces around on the vein walls, it's uncomfortable. So if you're well hydrated, then your veins are nice and plump, that doesn't hurt as much. Also, we're about to give you a lot of medicine. Some of these medications filter through your kidneys. If your kidneys are already dry, then that filter is dry. It increases the challenges for your kidneys to metabolize and filter out all of those medications. Nicotine cessation, we have a lot of help for you. We're willing to help family, friends, patients. Nicotine is very, very, very dangerous and hazardous for, for the bones, okay? It makes bones very thin, and brittle. So if you need help with that, please give us a call. We're, we're willing to help you with that. Your patient handbook is yours to keep. It has a lot of useful information for your surgery, for after surgery, some potential complications, and then how to prevent those. The last tab of that book, Diagnosis Specific Information, is generally just for you. It's custom made for your surgeon and for your surgery. So if you don't read the whole book, some people just don't have time or don't want to, that's okay. But please read that last tab. That's the one your surgeon wants you to really pay attention to. Also, please have your family and friends, whoever's going to be your caregiver after surgery, also read that. That has all of your home help, it has all of your instructions for how to get into and out of cars, into and out of bed, how to you know, set up some of your equipment, how to get your shoes and socks on, all right? So read that one, that's important. If anything in that book contradicts anything that your surgeon has specifically told you for your medical history and for the procedure that he's doing, please don't say, well, that's not what the book said, because. He's the author of the book, so if he changes it, then he's doing it for your own good, and he's doing it for your purpose. So you're getting your body ready. You're treating it like a growing kid. Drink your milk. Eat your vegetables. But now let's also get your house ready. It's important to remember after surgery, when you go home, you need a clear path. Walk around your house with the thought of where are my trip hazards? Look for and remove throw rugs, extension cords, sometimes coffee tables if it's in between where you're going to be setting and close quarters. Also think about pets and children. Pets can be a trip hazard. Children have lots of toys that can be a trip hazard. So think about where all of those are now. You know, if you need to have your pets crated, that's okay, or behind a gate, that's okay too. Make sure that if you have kids in your home, that their toys are contained to where if you're up and moving, you're not going to trip over them. Your recovery center for your house needs to be your bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, living room, den, study, all on one floor, preferably. If your bedroom's upstairs and everything else is downstairs, that's still okay. You're gonna be able to maneuver that. But if you are already out of breath and that's difficult to get up and down those stairs now, then you may wanna think about having a bedroom improvised downstairs if you don't have one available for you. Think also about your bathroom. So in your bathroom, you are trying to minimize your exposure to germs. You need a new toothbrush or toothbrush head if it's a electric toothbrush. It needs to be covered or in a medicine cabinet or a linen closet just so that it's not out and open to air. You also need to um, think about the fact that total joint patients don't reuse towels and you don't reuse dishes, okay? So that includes that bathroom cup. So if there's a bathroom cup, it's easier to put those little disposable paper cups in there so that you use one, throw it away. You wash your hands, you don't reuse the hand towel. So instead of making a lot of laundry for somebody, easier to just put a roll of paper towels in there. You wash your hands, you use paper towel, throw it away. That way you're not reusing dishes and reusing towels. In your shower, the loofah spongy net thing that some people use, you don't wanna reuse that. So it's easier to just use a clean towel and a clean washcloth. But the loofah spongy thing, it also collects germs. So if you have one of those, please throw it away. Think about being home for a couple of weeks. 
Okay? It's not difficult to take care of an ortho patient. It is somewhat time consuming. So for our caregivers, maybe if you could stock up, like you're going to be home for a couple of weeks, then they don't have to run out and run errands as often. Also, think about your most used items. Are they way up here or are they way down here? If it's something you use every day, you don't want to have to do a deep knee bend to get it heavy pots and pans, or if it's way up there, you don't want to tiptoe to have to reach that. So bring things that you use every day down to comfort level. Put them where they're easily accessible to you. Think about in the kitchen, who's the cook of the family? Now, if the patient's the cook of the family, then you have to start thinking ahead about meal preparation. Meal preparation's easy, doesn't have to be time consuming, doesn't have to be elaborate. Think about whole foods, your comfort foods. What do you like the best? Okay, if it's mac and cheese, then make it with whole wheat noodles or pasta and real cheese and real milk. You can make all of those ahead of time, put them in a casserole dish, put them in the freezer, label it, and you're good. You can do that with lots of casseroles. You can do vegetable prep, put those in freezer bags, label it, put those in crock pots. Now is a good crock pot time. If you're home alone, say your caregiver has to leave or they have to run some errands and you are home alone, please set up your recovery center. So wherever you're at during the day, you need easily accessible, your medications, a big glass of water, the hospital will give you a jug, keep it full of water, keep drinking it. If you're home alone and you're walking around your house, please have a cell phone on you because if you get somewhere where you sit down suddenly because you're dizzy or if you fall, then you need communication so that you can call for help. So the night before surgery, we're going to call you usually about 12 o'clock, a little bit after, confirm you still want surgery. Your surgery nurses will tell you when they want you to stop eating anything, and then they'll tell you what time you need to be at the hospital, and they'll also tell you what time your surgery is. When they tell you not to eat or drink anything, that includes gum, mints, and black coffee. You're not fasting for lab work, you're fasting to make sure your stomach's completely empty. This protects you with general anesthesia so that if you have something in your stomach and you're under general anesthesia, you increase your risk of aspirating it into your lungs. You aspirate that into your lungs, you now have pneumonia. So if you walk into the hospital and you're chewing gum, they won't do your surgery. There's a potential to cancel your surgery or move it to the end of the day when they know that your stomach's empty. Also, make sure you get a good night's rest. Please don't try to do all of the house prep, meal prep, all of those things that you're trying to do, packing, everything else, the night of surgery. It makes you tired. You come to hospital and you're just tired. Get a good night's rest and that way when you get to the hospital, you're ready to have surgery. We will give you in pre-admission testing, when you do your lab work and everything, we will give you a special soap. We will give you instructions on how to use that soap. So what is this soap? It is an antibacterial, antimicrobial. It's called chlorhexidine. Your doctors may also give you an additional soap to use. When you start showering with that soap, neck down, don't put that on your face or in your hair. Use a clean washcloth and a clean towel every time you take that shower and then put on clean pajamas the night before surgery, the morning of surgery, either one. Put clean sheets on your bed so that when you get home, everything is clean and ready for you. Now, when you start taking those showers, please don't put on any lotions or powders, and certainly don't shave that extremity for seven days before surgery. Shaving causes micro abrasions in the skin that increases your potential risk for infection. If you put lotions or powders on, you're introducing new bacteria, and that also increases your risk. So that's why we ask you not to do those things. Now, the morning of surgery, what to bring with you. Your pharmacist will ask you to bring your original prescriptions. They want to look at the bottles to see what you take, how much of it you take, and the strength of it. Most of the time, they're just going to give it back to you. Please do not bring any pain pills, sleeping pills, or over-the-counters. Most of the time, we're just going to want a list of your medications. Bring with you also your assistive devices. If you have glasses, hearing aids, dentures, braces, walkers, any of that, bring it with you. Also think about your comfort items. If you don't like hospital toothpaste or the hospital toothbrush, then bring the one that you prefer. Your room is your personal space, so you can take whatever you want. Make sure you bring loose-fitting clothes, easy slip-on shoes, no flip-flops, please. 
something that is easy to get your shoe, your feet into and out of so that you're not trying to tie them. If you think about getting up and walking around, our hospitals have robes. You don't have to bring a robe. The next morning, if you want to put your clothes back on, you're free to do so. Also think about bringing your identification, um, insurance cards, and any copayment that you, you have prearranged with the hospital. Also remember that you're going to go home with prescriptions, and some of those prescriptions are narcotics. So if you're going to have someone go fill your prescriptions before you get home, they're going to need your identification and your insurance card and your copayments. If someone's going to pick those up for you, they will also need their identification. Please bring your family and friends. They're welcome with us. They're part of our team. Your room is your personal space, so you can have people in there if you want, but we don't have set visiting hours and we don't have visitor age limits. Whatever you do bring though, please label it. Leave most of your valuables at home. We don't need heirloom jewelry, watches, anything like that. But if you wanna bring your cell phone, please remember to label it. Also remember to label your charger. That's the number one thing people forget. On the day of surgery, you will check in with pre-op. Pre-op nurses will come and take you back. You can bring a family member or two back to pre-op. It's very close back there, so one or two only, please. And pre-op will start your IV, will put you in a gown. You'll meet your anesthesia provider. They'll go over all of your medications, all of your medical history, any reactions you've ever had to anesthesia, and then your surgeon and you will mark your surgery site so we all agree where you're, where you're having surgery. From pre-op, you'll go to holding, and that's just outside the OR, kind of a staging area. From holding, you go into surgery. Surgery is very white, very bright, somewhat cold. Don't worry, we put a bear hugger on you. And what a bear hugger is, is it looks like an air mattress, but it's hooked up to a warming unit. And that warming unit keeps you warm. If your anesthesiologist is going to do a block, then they'll do your block and that numbs your leg or numbs your arm. Your surgery takes about one to three hours. Your surgeon will tell you how long he, he, he thinks it's going to take. After surgery, your anesthesia provider will take you to post-anesthesia care unit or recovery, and the surgeon will go out to the waiting room and talk to the family. In recovery, you are monitored for vital signs, for nausea, for pain. Uh, they wait till you wake up so that you can take some ice chips. Once you're awake and stable, you go from recovery to your room. That's where the family members meet back up with you. If you're going to have a knee surgery, then you may have a tourniquet. And what is a tourniquet? It goes on your thigh. So if you wake up and there's a red mark on your, on your thigh, then your surgeon used a tourniquet. It goes away, it's not a permanent mark, but it may bruise you if you bruise easily. Once you get to your room, we usually have you up and walking, usually about two hours after surgery or the next morning. Please remember, do not get up by yourself. The first 24 hours after anesthesia is your highest potential risk for falling. So never get up by yourself, push your call light, someone will come in and help you get up. We don't use Foley catheters routinely anymore. They're only as medical necessity. There's ortho chairs in your rooms. If you're able to, it's better to get up and eat sitting up than it is lying in bed. So if you're able to get up, please get up for your meals. We're going to set up all of your equipment and we're gonna start teaching you how to use your equipment. And we're gonna teach your family members how to use your equipment. So it's important that whoever your caregiver is going to be, that they are there with you also so that they can get that education. And then the rest of the day, just rest. You've had a big surgery. Let's talk about pain management. Our goal for pain management is to manage your pain so that you're able to continue to eat, drink, sleep without being disturbed by pain, and most importantly, to get up and move. So your goal is not to be pain-free, but to be able to manage your pain so that you can continue to do those important things. Please let us know what doesn't work for you. Please let us know if something makes you nauseated or itch, we'll medicate you for both before we give you pain medications. Also remember to be open to other different types of, of therapies. We have cryotherapy, ice therapy. Getting up and moving also decreases pain. When you think about pain, 
Think about everyone using the same pain scale. So at the hospital, we use zero is no pain, 10 is the worst imaginable. When you go home, use the same scale when you're talking to your family or friends or caregivers. Your goal is to be somewhere on that pain scale that your pain does not interfere with three very important things, mobility, hydration, nutrition. If at any time your pain interferes with those three things, it's important to manage it. So when we talk about pain tolerance, we don't talk about how tough are you. And a lot of people do that because most people that I talk to don't want to be nauseated. They don't want to be itchy. They don't want to be constipated. They don't want to be sleepy or they don't want to be addicted. But in the short acute period of time that you're recovering from total joint procedures, it's important to manage your pain. For total knee surgery, we typically do what we call a block. And a block is an injection your anesthesia provider puts right about the top of your thigh. It numbs your whole leg. You lose sensation of that extremity, but you do not lose function. So you can still get up and walk. You just have no sensation to that extremity. That helps you get up earlier and walk sooner. The thing about having a knee block is it wears off coming up your leg. So you will be able to feel your toes and then you'll feel your lower leg, calf muscle, that type of thing. Once you start feeling sensation in your lower leg, please go ahead and take some pain medication. You don't want that to wear off above your knee and not have any pain medication in your system. Another option for pain control is cryotherapy or ice and gel packs. Cryotherapy is generally better because it provides a more consistently cold temperature to help decrease swelling, numbs the skin, and decreases the pain. The nature of an ortho surgery causes heat and inflammation. Those heat up ice packs, gel packs, frozen rice, frozen peas, more quickly than having cryotherapy, which is more consistently cold and therapeutic. For our knee patients, you will have a walker. If you already have a walker, please bring your walker. Our physical therapist would like you to practice on what you're going home with. If you don't have a walker, don't purchase one. We will issue you one at the hospital. You also will go home with an incentive spirometer. This is a breathing exercise that helps you expand your lungs and decrease your potential risk for pneumonia. It also oxygenates your blood really well, and that's beneficial. We send you home on a CPM machine. That's a continuous passive motion machine that continuously moves your knee up and down to keep it nice and loose and limber. We will put TED hose on you. TED hose are on both legs. They are an anti-thrombolytic hose that decrease your potential risk for blood clots. The cornerstone of your recovery is physical therapy. While you're at the hospital, you will see our physical therapist. They will work with you on walking, they will work with you on equipment. They will teach you your safety instructions. They will teach your family members how to help you into and out of equipment. They teach you how to go up and down stairs if you need step training. If you have something that you're not sure about at home that you think you may need help with, please be sure to ask your physical therapist at this time because we want to make sure when you get home, you're able to use your equipment effectively and safely. Discharge planning starts before you have surgery. You do need a ride home. You need someone to take you home. It's a good idea to have someone to stay with you for at least the first week, preferably two, depending on your medical condition and your health history. You may need a subacute facility. That is done after surgery. Your surgeon will give clinical information to our case managers if they feel like you need to go to a subacute facility. Nothing is set in stone for discharge until you're safe for discharge. You have to meet medical criteria for discharge, and each one of our surgeons works with you, your family, and our medical providers to make sure that you are safe to go home. This is some of the equipment you may want for your home. The first one is an accessory kit or a hip kit sometimes called. That usually has five pieces in it, a grabber, a long-handled shoehorn to help you get your shoes on and off, a sock assist, you put your sock on that, throw it down to your foot, pull it on, 
and a long handled sponge to wash your lower extremities so you don't have to bend over in the shower. In the shower, it's a good idea to have a shower bench, a shower chair, someplace safe to sit. In the shower is not a safe place to get dizzy and fall. So the shower bench or chair is a safe place to sit. It's also easier to get up from the toilet if it's elevated. An elevated position helps you get up easier. If you're going to purchase an elevated toilet seat extender, then it's a good idea to purchase the one that has the handles. That way you can use your upper extremity to help you get up. This is a picture of the cryotherapy that comes for all ortho surgeries. You can purchase those at some medical supply stores. You can purchase those at some of your physician offices. Some of our physicians have a medical company bring you a cryotherapy if you want it. A recliner may be a good idea. Sometimes it's easier and more comfortable to sleep in a recliner for the first couple of weeks after surgery than it is for you to lay flat in bed. If you're in bed, you might want to have a couple of pillows that prop you up a little bit so that you're more comfortable. All right, last three things are most important. Infection control is very important. We start this before you ever have surgery with the special so soaps that you're using. After surgery, when you see us in your room, we will hand sanitize, we will foam in and foam out before we touch you. We are one part of the team. Patients are another part of the team. Patients should also hand sanitize before they eat or drink anything. Family members are another part of the team. Family and friends should hand sanitize before they prepare meals for you or before they touch you. Once you go home, it's equally important to remember to hand sanitize. So in your bathroom, in your kitchen, maybe at the front door, it's convenient to have some hand sanitizer so that as anyone comes and goes, they can hand sanitize as conveniently as they need to touch you or prepare meals for you. Please don't reuse towels, washcloths, dishes, utensils, or glasses. Signs and symptoms of infection will be given to you at discharge. Don't forget about this. If you feel like you have an infection or you're starting to get an infection, please contact your surgeon. Remember that after you have a total joint replacement, it's important to always speak up. If something doesn't look right, feel right, sound right, please say something. That goes for the patient, the family, and the friends. We're all part of a team. After discharge, remember to tell your providers that you have a total joint. Your dentist needs to know this. They usually prescribe you an antibiotic right before having your teeth cleaned. Any invasive diagnostic procedure that you have done, that provider also needs to know that you have a total joint. That way they can protect you, but if they don't know about it, they can't protect you. Blood clots are another potential complication after surgery. To prevent blood clots, you do three things, <clears throat> mobility, medication, and your TED hose. Mobility helps a lot of things. It helps prevent blood clots, it helps decrease pain, and it increases your recovery strength. Medications, you'll go home with an antiplatelet according to your medical history and your allergies. The TED hose, they're difficult to wear, they're difficult to put on, but they could save your life. After surgery, food is medicine. Medications can decrease your appetite, so please remember that if you need to put your food on a time schedule, that may help you get the food into your system that you need to heal, recover, and have energy. Some of the things that you can do to increase your appetite are listed here for you. Please remember if you're using a protein shake, you need one that has high protein and low carbs. So make sure you read the labels. Good nutrition is important all the time, but good nutrition is critically important after surgery. High protein diets and medications that you're taking can sometimes cause constipation. This is where hydration is also important. So please make sure you're hydrating well. If you're getting constipated, you can have a stool softener. If stool softeners aren't helping you, you may try a gentle overnight laxative. Ask your provider or your surgeon for recommendations. Here are some resources for your diet so that you can find something new, find something fun, something that is stimulating, appetizing, and encourages you to eat. After your follow-up appointment with your surgeon, it may be a fun idea 
to go out and have your favorite lunch, your favorite restaurant. If you're not up to it, use one of these resources and find a fun new recipe that you want to try. Thank you for giving me your time and attention. And if you have anything that you want to ask me, please feel free to call me. I hope you enjoy this experience.